Super Smash Bros. is a casual walk through the history of the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate roster. My name is Joe. And my name is Matt. And if you're new here, what we are doing on this show is we usually are playing one game for every character in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate from 1984's Duck Hunt to 2019's Fire Emblem Three Houses. But uh, this is a bonus episode where we just talk about games that uh, are tangentially usually connected to Smash? Usually. Usually. Mostly. Mostly. Sometimes. Most and sometimes the there are video games played under duress. Yeah. Like this one. Uh, which, to be fair, there are worse games that you have been made to be to play under duress. Yeah. Much worse. Because we are uh, doing an episode on Kingdom Hearts 2, the PlayStation 2 game that released in 2005. Uh, because Sora's in Smash, and that still doesn't feel real to say. Mainly because and you haven't played Smash Brothers since then. I haven't played Smash in a very long while. I played some when I was on vacation last year, but that was in, uh... June. Uh, <laughs> that was only one episode ago. So, at time of recording. Yeah, kinda. Wait, what? That was, that was Fire Emblem ago. That's true. Oh, God. You said one episode. You meant one game. <laughs> Fire Emblem was four episodes, Matt. Those are parts of one episode. We, we That's how we do the numbering. Eh, I guess. But it is... Game Wars 2 is a pretty good game. I like it. It's a, a sequel that has improved in pretty much every single way over the uh, original game, which is bad. <laughs> This is definitely the best one of the ones that I have been forced to play. Um, I actually, like, got to a point... So, when I did the, the 100% run for this one, I got the Platinum Trophy, I did, I did everything. I did my time. And this one, um, I, I really got into the groove of the, of the gameplay, of the combat and all that. To, like... It, it it ended up being like legitimately pretty fun. Uh, I can't say the I can't say the same about like some other parts of the gameplay because everything about the Disney worlds still sucks. Everything, not everything, almost everything, not everything. I the ones that have like terrible gimmicks like Port Royal. Yeah, no, that fucking world sucks. Obviously, Atlantica is the best world in the game, but we don't even need to talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that world also fucking sucks. That's really the only one I can think of that, like, straight up just... I guess I like Pride Lands, but I can see why you don't. It's very it's very obvious why some people might not like it. Uh, I just like drifting as a lion. I think that's fun, but, like, it, it has the same problem... Not as bad as Atlantica, but it does have the same problem as Atlantica, where it's just like, yeah, uh, half your shit doesn't work here. Have fun. I just I feel like the best of the worlds are inoffensive, and that's not really a. It's not. A, that's not saying much. It's not a very high bar. Eh, I would overall disagree with that, but like. Eh, eh, eh. I think some of them are a lot of fun. I like Olympus. I like getting to go down into the underworld. I think that's neat. Uh, it's the most involved Olympus has ever been and ever will be, by the way. Uh, cool. Well, no, that's not true. Kingdom Hearts 3 is pretty fucking involved. I mean, it better so be. There's that. The, um, the numbered game. Yeah, but like, it's more than just... Kingdom Hearts 1 and all the spinoffs where when you go to Olympus, it's here's a place where you do tournaments and that's all this world is. It's not terrible for the spinoffs, but well, it is for some of them. The way that 358 does it, but that's not saying much because everything 358 does is bad. Yeah, I was going to say <laughs> that compared to what in that game? But uh, like I, I like going back to a uh, Timeless River, I think that world is fun outside of the fucking fire building. That part could fuck off. Well, that's uh, the thing. 100%. The aesthetics of that world are very cool. But actually playing it, it might be the worst world. Honestly. I highly disagree. You're going to look me in the fucking eyes and tell me that 
fucking Timeless River is worse than Port Royal? You're going to look me in the goddamn eyes and tell me that? You can't kill the enemies unless they're standing in moonlight, Matt. Yeah, and Timeless River has cars. In one stage. It still has cars. I mean, those are the worst Heartless in the game, but I don't think that makes it the worst world. There's only two of them. Trust me, I hate those cars just as much as you do. I, just, yeah, I, I don't I, think that makes it the worst. There's just not there's not really anything in the way of gameplay in Timeless River. I mean, it plays like the rest of the game. That's the thing. Yeah, the there's whole game not much, plays roughly the same. Yeah, there's not much gameplay in this game besides the combat, despite the high yeah, amount it's of an time. an action game. Despite the high amount of time that you're not in combat, you're just walking between different points in the world. That's what I'm saying. And fighting the... It's an action game. What are you talking about? It's an action game. Maybe it would be better if it was a platform. That's the game. Thank you. No, that's not the case, because you played the one that tried to be a platformer. It's the, uh, make it a good platformer, then it'll be better. The thing overall is that there's so much you can do with the idea of playing around in Disney worlds, and they largely don't do anything with that, because it's not like the Heartless have anything to do with those worlds. Yeah, but also remember, this is like I think Kingdom Hearts 3 kind of does a little bit better with it. But remember, this is a PlayStation 2 game. They can only do so much. I've, I've played PlayStation 2 games. You could do plenty. I What would they be able to do on a PS2? Anything. Anything at all. Like what? Name one example. I just, I just want For... the Disney worlds to feel like they have anything to do with Disney. What do you mean like they have anything to do with it? That, okay, that phrasing doesn't make sense. I think I get what you mean, but you're going to have to reword it because you just said the Disney worlds don't feel like they have anything to do with Disney. I, I feel like they're, they're like, I might as well be watching a video screen with badly rendered <laughs> versions of the movies in them. And then everything that happens between those points is just, it, it doesn't feel like it's actually from these movies at all. I still highly disagree with that. Also, you're the one that's admitted that you haven't seen half these movies. I've seen a lot of the ones <laughs> in Kingdom Hearts 2. That's true. Isn't Aladdin one of the ones you don't think you've seen? Or am I crazy? I know Lion King, yes, I think. I've seen Lion King. I've seen Mulan. I've seen Pirates of the Caribbean. I've seen Little Mermaid. I've seen that's Nightmare Before Christmas. That's a good movie. I've seen Steamboat Willie. That barely counts. That thing's like 30 <laughs> seconds long. Uh, it's longer than that, but like in my mind, it's 30 seconds long. And that's like, it feels like these locations could be anything. That's, that's what I don't like about them. And uh, like, you know, my problem with the Kingdom Hearts story with regards to his Disney characters, where the only plot that we get, that we get to have in most of them is just a reenactment of the movies. We don't actually get to see these characters in meaningfully new situations. So I'm going to level with you. That's what most people want. I don't. I really don't want that. I understand why you wouldn't want that. That is what most people want. Why do people want that? Because they want to play through their favorite Disney movie. Just watch the movie. They, is this why live action same. Lion King made so much money? No, you... Watching the movie is not the same as being a character in the movie. I'm not a character in the movie. I'm a character witnessing the movie happen. You're playing as Sora, who is now in the movie. Yeah, and he sits there on the sidelines commentating on the movie. Oh, God, you're going to love Kingdom Hearts 3. I don't <laughs> think I will. I... I'm picturing a scene in Tangled where there's like a shot for shot remake of a scene happening and Sora, Donald, and Goofy are in the corner watching it happen. Literally I'm watching it happen. I'm aware of at least one shot for shot remake in Kingdom Hearts 3. <sighs> but like, I, I genuinely don't see that as that much of an issue. I think just getting to go on a tour, uh, I think aesthetically the worlds are... Like, the best they could do for a PS2 game. Uh, like I, I think gen genuinely, they, they don't look as good as the movies, but that's because the movies were 
made to be a movie. This is a PlayStation 2 game. I just... This is what PS2 but that's games the, look that's like. The, the settings of these movies are very generic for the most part. I disagree 100%. They all feel different. Well, okay, no. That's In not what I said. Like, I, that's not what I said. <laughs> I said they're generic, not that they're the same. Well, that's Disney. You're talking about Disney. Well, then maybe there's a problem with the core premise here. I don't know. You're the only person I've ever heard have that complaint. But, like, I do I do get the, the criticism of, like, yeah, this is just, like, the movie happening and Sora is there, sort of. Uh, like, that, that makes sense to me why that would annoy some people. And I do prefer the worlds that try to tell their own story. Yeah, that and, like, and that's why I think Beast Castle has like one of the better uses of that world in general. Kind of, yeah. Like it's it is still retelling the movie, but like the presence of Organization Thirteen there feels like it it's more like it's tackling it from a different angle. I know, I know that he's just filling the same that Zaldin is just filling the same role as Gaston, but he has a more involved role in. Uh, specifically uh, affecting the beast and trying to like mentally upset him as much as uh, kill him. So it it feels meaningfully different from Gaston. And that's, that's what I, I want more of where even if we're still going to have these characters going through the same arcs, I want to see them happen a little differently. I want to see something new out of this. And that's and I, I, I bring this up all the time. That's why the moment of Luxord invoking parlay on Jack Sparrow is electric to me because it, it is a it is a Kingdom Hearts moment that is invoking the rules of the Disney world that it's taking place in. It's something new using that established source material instead of just being the source material again. Uh, and I I think the story of the second part of Port Royal, it still sucks to play because it's fucking Port Royal, and they're, they bring back the cursed pirates because God is dead. Um, But, like, the idea of them going like, huh, this curse is pretty uh, interesting. What if we gave it to a heartless? Have fun with that, dipshits. Mm-hmm. Love it. That was... I, I think... <laughs> I, well, no, I did I, not enjoy that boss fight very much. Well, I'm not talking about gameplay wise. I'm talking about story wise. What if we gave it to a heart? What if we oh, gave well. this curse to a heartless? Oh, yeah, then it's, it's back to the fucking heartless. Yeah, that heartless is. It, what are you talking? That's exactly what you're asking. That's exactly what you're asking for. I want the thing that I just described is literally exactly what you're asking no. for. A guy sees these cursed coins and is like, "This does an undead curse thing." What if I gave it to this monster? I just hate that good boss. You're not going to get me that. to say anything good about that boss, no matter what. <laughs> I'm not talking gameplay wise. I don't hate that boss as much as you do, but like, no, it's I'm it talking seeps, in terms it seeps of into it seeps into the emotions. <laughs> so, make it about something else in that world, just not that boss. You don't understand how much I hate that boss. I don't know. I had fun watching that boss. I had a good time. <laughs> yeah, you had a good time watching it, huh? <laughs> That's the role you take in video games. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I'm i at the point where I like Kingdom Hearts the most when it's Kingdom Hearts, not when it's Disney. And the Kingdom Hearts story in this is, is largely good. I I think that there are parts of it that are stupidly written and not especially well directed, but it's it's very earnest and going for it in a way that I don't feel like the Disney side of things is doing here. Everything about Roxas and the prologue, it it like it really feels like there was an inspired idea there that that everyone on the the writing team was committed to doing, and even though they they fall into some writing traps that make it feel hokey it's still it, like it still hits be- because the emotions are very genuine uh i think that part of that also might just be uh that disney is a famously super restrictive company with what oh, you of are course allowed it to is. do with their shit of course that's the reason it's like that but like the result is what i'm focused on 
because mm-hmm. I we all know the reason, but I don't think the reason is as interesting to talk about in this scenario because the, Disney is strict is the most obvious thing in the world. But the question of like what in Kingdom Hearts is successful and what is not, I think, is a bit more interesting. And I think that it it people would would tend not to go with the idea that the Disney stuff is the stuff that doesn't work in Kingdom Hearts. And that's Oh, a hundred percent I I don't know if they'd say if they'd use the wording of doesn't work, but I know that pretty much everybody would agree that it's the least interesting part of Kingdom Hearts. People that are really into it believe that. But I, I think if you're kind of like a casual fan on the side, or like even someone that doesn't play Kingdom Hearts you probably assume that Disney's the whole point. And I mean, it is the point. It's, it's the reason, but I, it's not the appeal, especially not to me. So I like everything that, that is Disney and kingdom hearts is just an affectation at this point. It, I don't feel excited to see anything of that is Disney in this franchise. And that's, that's just, so far from what I thought this franchise was going to end up being. I mean, because it's advertised as the Disney game. Yeah. That's the thing. Because you're running around with Donald and Goofy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I would agree that the most interesting part is the outside of the Disney stuff. Because, like, I fucking love Organization 13. I think they're fucking awesome. Um, granted, most of that is the teenager in me talking who teenage weebs fucking love organization 13. And when I say I love organization 13, I mean, I love Xemnas. as, as I am, as I'm pushing 30 now, uh, I think they could do with a little less edge, but I like their deal. I like the idea of what their story is a lot. Would be nice if they weren't in black cloaks, called organization 13 and all of their names have an x in it that's all a little much for me but like the stories that are being told of they are fake people that are wrestling with the idea of like what emotions are and like what it means to have emotions when you're not supposed to it's that all works that's all the really good stuff in kingdom hearts 2 i just really like Xemnas. I think Xemnas is great because his voice and half of it is his voice. All of it his is his voice, voice actor. His voice actor is having such a good goddamn time playing this man. Xemnas' uh, voice actor is fantastic. Xemnas' character does nothing for me. I, I, well, his character is I'm the evil person, um, but his voice carries that character so hard because he's just having such Paul St. Peter is having such a good goddamn time playing that character. And mm-hmm. I'm so happy that he continues to play that character throughout the entire series. He never gets recast. I just, Thank God, I think the problem that I have with Xemnas is that he's the most boring member of organization 13, except for Zaldin, <laughs> but Zaldin's a really good boss fight. So I give him a pass. Zaldin's voice is like the literal opposite of of Xemnas 2 where like Zaldin sucks. <laughs> Zaldin really sucks, but <laughs> the bar his for voice, final his boss voice actor, and main villain should not be Zaldin. <laughs> that should not be the bar. His voice actor sounds like he's in the like recording studio at six o'clock in the morning and he doesn't want to fucking be there. It's great. Uh, <laughs> uh but then also Zigbar. I like Zigbar a lot just because he's an asshole. I think it's funny. Yeah, he's he's a really fun character. And he's we're, we're going to see a lot of Zigbar throughout the entire story, by the way. So, yeah, I mean, he they much, know they know he's great. Pretty much all of the organization that appears in Kingdom Hearts 2, except Zaldin, is better than Xemnas. <laughs> Even Saix Sa- is a better Xemnas than Xemnas. Are you going to put Demix in that category? I willfully forget Demix. But you know what? Every team of 13 goddamn people needs to have a loser. So he does his job. Look, all I'm saying is that the best Organization 13 member isn't even fucking in Kingdom Hearts 2 outside of being a side boss. Okay, Joe. 
What's that tone supposed to be? <laughs> you just have a type. I do, and that type has knives. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do, gen- like, Larkseed is genu- genuinely, like, my favorite member of Organization 13, just because she's one of the... She is a member... She's the only member of the organization that seems to be having more fun being in the organization than Zigbar is. Zigbar's having a good time. Larkseed's having a fucking blast. <laughs> I love her dearly. For, yeah, for the for the most part, organization thirteen are all pretty good. Um, it, but it's just like really, Zemnis is is one of the least interesting, and that that hurts the end game. I think because once we cross that threshold into it's the point of no return and we're fighting Zemnis, I just kind of lose interest in the game. It's a pretty good fight, but the story I don't really care for anything that happens past that point. <laughs> I I kind of like his their back and forth in the very at the very end. Yeah, yeah, that very last Sora and Riku part that works, that works a lot. But I I wish that could have been against a villain that's more interesting. I know you've also talked about like you kind of liked the moment of like Sora asking like, I mean, "There's more. To, there's more to have your heart than just being angry." Like, don't you remember? He's like, "No, of course I fucking don't." And then he disappears. Yeah, like that's the point of this, you idiot. I don't remember it. I don't remember any of it. Yeah, I, I just, I, I wanted them to lean into that more. Which that's just my fucking mantra for this franchise. I wanted them to, to, I wanted them to go harder with this one point that was really good. I cannot wait for us to get to Kingdom Hearts 3 and we hit a specific point where you can feel the dev team going, oh shit, right, we were supposed to wrap a bunch of shit up this game. (laughs) Oops. Um, And then it all happens in the span of three hours. Kingdom Hearts is a very frustrating franchise for me right now because I don't hate it. And that makes the things that I don't like all the more (laughs) frustrating. Because there are so many things I don't like. There's a lot of things I don't like. And if I just fucking hated this franchise, then I could just be like, all right, whatever, have fun. But be like, I don't hate it. So I'm just so upset <laughs> that it never quite gives me what I want. But it keeps it keeps pointing over in the corner and saying, look, that's what it could be. It's so fucking frustrating. But that's all that's all story wise. Uh, Gameplay wise, I think this is the best feeling game in the series yeah um, the, the like, combat just flows so incredibly well um i've called it baby's first devil may cry before and i obviously that is like a little derisive but i also think that it kind of gets the idea where it, it has that well, it's, same... it's in the same way that like pokemon is baby's first jrpg like yeah. it's it's this it's the same concept but simplified for like beginners yeah, it gets the visceral feeling of how good it is to be good at a character action game while being a lot easier to play than a character action game. And the way everything flows into each other uh, with some really fun back and forth between how the magic system works how and how you can use the drive forms kind of in tandem with each other to manage your magic meter... That was all the stuff that I got really into. I got really into making split second decisions on the risk versus reward of whether I should be using cure and whether I should be using a drive form and which drive form I should be using it. it, The fights stayed really exciting uh, through the like past the end of the game into all the post game stuff. The post game stuff was when I had the most fun with it. Mainly because going through the yeah, Disney the, worlds was the part I didn't like. The data organization fights are, are fucking rad. I really, really like the Marluxia fight a lot because of how much it sort of tosses everything out and is like, oh, yeah, no, his attacks don't do damage. So cure. Well, most of them, some of them do, which is, I think, against the point, but whatever. Um but, like, his attacks don't do damage. Cure is kind of useless in this fight. Don't get hit. Don't yeah. get hit. <laughs> yeah, and it's Like, it it's is also an entire like, fight built around do not get hit. Yeah, and it's a pretty good adaptation of the idea of Chain of Memories, too. So, it's... A f- that's a fantastic fight. The data organization fights are good. 
<laughs> that one especially is really good. And can you believe they weren't in the original game? Yes, I can. Very easily. Uh, none of the, not even the absentee silhouettes were in the game. Uh, yeah, that actually makes even more sense. Yeah. Uh, but like, I know a lot of people really like Birth by Sleep because when, when the debate of like what, which Kingdom Hearts game is the best uh, in terms of gameplay, uh, people will either say two or they'll say Birth by Sleep. I don't really love the deck system in Birth by Sleep. I don't hate it. But also the fact that we literally on stream recently needed somebody to come in and do a college lecture on how it fucking works. Yeah, so at, I have no idea. A little, I think a little bit antithetical to the idea of Kingdom Hearts being a for beginners action game. I have no idea when this bonus episode is going to release. But r- right now, as we are recording it, that lecture was last night. I have not finished Terra's story in Birth by Sleep yet. And where I'm at with Birth by Sleep right now. And maybe this will change as we get further into it, but I don't like how much of it is just you are always focused on on working on your build. Every single thing you do is working on your build. The uh, like explaining how you, like you need to be melding every ten seconds in that game, and like as soon as you hit level three with a skill, in which hey you hit level three with that skill because you've been using it, and maybe as you've been using it, you really like it. Okay, now it's time to get rid of it and prob- and maybe not use it again. That, I hate when video games do that. It's also weird because in 2, you don't really need to worry about a build at all. You- Sora has the stats he's going to get, and you can increase them with items if you want. Yeah, and, and like, like you, you need you- to learn with what Sora can do. And you can change your build in 2. And I did have to change my build a few times in 2. But changing your build in 2 is changing what specific things you're extra good at. Whereas changing your build in Birth by Sleep is your basic abilities are completely different. And I do not like that. I I don't like constantly swapping out the basics of my moveset. And it just, it feels really bad that in everything I do, I constantly have to be thinking about the experience points I'm getting. And they're not always literal experience points, but like getting something to level three, getting the next level of the finishers, getting the next level of a shot lock, that all of that, I like, I I count that all under the phrase of focusing on my experience points. And that every single action I take in that video game is about my experience points. And I hate that. I really, really do not like that. And it's not a bad video game, but it's just, this is not what I like out of video games. I, I mean, like I said, we're still early right now in Birth by Sleep, but it's, it's just, it's not going to overtake two for me. Yeah, honestly, I don't think any of them will. Three might come close because three does feel very for for as easy as three is. One of the reasons three is so easy is because it feels so fluid and good to play. Mm -hmm. Um, That's that's the problem. Uh, Sora is a little too easy to control. And like, it's a little I don't want to say too easy to understand, but like it's extremely easy to understand uh, oh, how to play Kingdom Hearts 3. I just found a really good way. I don't want to just make this an episode about Birth by Sleep, but Birth by Sleep's what we're playing right now. <laughs> it's on my mind. Um, I don't know. Maybe this is the bonus episode of, of the rest of Kingdom Hearts. But in Birth you know, minus by, the four games we haven't played in Kingdom Hearts 2, you get better at the game by being better at the game. You, the player, become more skilled. And in Birth by Sleep, you get better at the game by unlocking things and leveling up. And yes, in Kingdom Hearts 2, you do level up your character. And yes, in Birth by Sleep, you do need to get skilled as a player. But there's so much more focus on the character's strength in Birth by Sleep than there is on the player's skill in Kingdom Hearts 2. And I I like games about the player's skill way more. and. That's just where Birth by Sleep does not do it for me. Yeah, I can see that. Two is really good about that to the point that Kingdom Hearts 2, when you start the game on critical mode, gives you an optional ability to not gain experience points. 
because they know what they're about. And I, I, I'm assuming Birth by Sleep has that too. But I can't imagine doing that in Birth by Sleep. I'm not actually sure if it does. I know 3 does. 3 absolutely does. Um, I think that might be the only one. If Birth by Sleep doesn't do it, then it's just it's just Nomura admitting that he didn't make the kind of game that I want to play. I, well, that's that's the weird thing about Kingdom Hearts is you can feel in every single game that the priorities for the kind of game they wanted to make are different. And sometimes, i.e. most of the time, that's not exactly to its benefit. Mm. <laughs> because they are obviously very good at making the kind of game that Kingdom Hearts 2 is. And they are not as good at making the kind of game that most of the other games are. Yeah, it was understandable in Chain of Memories, because you can't make Kingdom Hearts on Game Boy Advance. You just, you can't. And I I respect that they had that challenge. Uh, even if I greatly dislike the solution they came up with. But we're at the point where you definitely can make Kingdom Hearts on the PSP. So why yeah. didn't they? I mean, this is the closest to a regular ass Kingdom Hearts game that we have played so far, mm -hmm. which is part of the problem. Um, but yeah, it is a lot. I don't think Dream Drop is as bad with this as Birth by Sleep is. Again, I don't know anything about Recoded. I don't even think I've ever seen fucking gameplay of Recoded, like genuinely. I have a feeling that we're not going to walk out of this saying that Recoded is one of the better ones. It's just oh, just a hunch. Not. Just a feeling I've got. I already know the story is terrible, so like... It's Riku. It's, He's got bugs in him. It's already a bad, bad start. Uh, But like, yeah, I think it just comes down to this team is really good at making action games and they just seem to desperately not want to make action games. <laughs> and that's the weirdest, that's the weirdest thing. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Anyways, you know what's pretty good in Kingdom Hearts 2? Music's pretty good in Kingdom Hearts 2. I was Hearts trying to come up with a joke, good. but I couldn't think of anything in time. Music, music's pretty good in Kingdom Hearts 2. It is. Shimamura doesn't miss. Also, hey, you uh, you mentioned the, the prologue earlier as something that's good about Kingdom Hearts 2. Hey, yeah, hot take. The prologue of Kingdom Hearts 2 is actually pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking fantastic like i think it's i think it's it's i can accept the criticism that maybe it's too fucking long most of the people that tell you that will also not say that about persona 4 but whatever um and no no, no one is allowed to like persona 4 <laughs> at all if they complain about the opening of kingdom hearts 2 you're not like allowed I, to like Persona 4 as a video game <laughs> if you have a problem with the opening of kingdom hearts 2 like, I, I, I can accept the criticism that it's too long. I don't think it is. I think it's fine. Like, it's it's what? Like, fucking three hours? But uh, it, shit is happening the whole time. Yeah, the story's going hard from minute one. Except for the Seven Wonders of Twilight Town. I, I think that is a tedious part. Um, yeah, that part's weak. Other than that. But other than that. It's the I weak part. Is, the well, there's thing. also doing the jobs in town, but they kind of knew that part was going to be tedious. And so you don't even need to get that. You just need to do one job and you can go to Hainer and just, I'm done. I don't even hate it. It doesn't jobs. matter. They're, they're fun. They're fun mini games. It's fine. Uh, but well, yeah, they're fun mini games, but it's just it, the game kind of expects you to do them like multiple times. That's the, that's the issue. But like they don't actually make you do that so mm -hmm. but like yeah i really like the prologue of kingdom hearts 2 i think roxas is a really good character and i think the story of the prologue is like very well written and also christopher lee is obviously confused but having a good time <laughs> <laughs> batman hunted nazis and now he's talking about nobodies and did, look he did a lot of shit <laughs> he was also he was also a death metal musician he sure was. I read actually uh, yesterday somebody did a tweet about Christopher Lee's life. And uh, one of the facts was he's the only actor from the Lord of the Rings trilogy that actually met J.R.R. Tolkien. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> like he apparently he like read has had read the books once a year, every year from the year they were released to the year that he died. Um, and he did actually meet Tolkien at one point. Uh, there's um, also the famous story from those movies of how like Tolkien, of how uh, 
of how Peter Jackson was trying to give him notes on like how to act when his character is being stabbed, <laughs> and Christopher Lee's like, "No, I was I was in the war. I know I've how stabbed it is. a person. I know how it sounds yeah. in books." Um, my though I did also find out that apparently as a teenager he like dated some country's princess and the like her dad was like, "Yeah, you can marry her if you want." He was what like, the "Now fuck? I'm good." And then he just did other stuff. What the fuck? <laughs> Christopher Lee apparently lived the world's most interesting life. Um, and you know what? I'd believe it. You don't get a voice like that without living the most interesting life a human being has ever lived. Mm-hmm. Christopher Lee had one of the best voices in mankind. Like, it's up there with fucking James Earl Jones and Morgan Freeman. And I'm sure there's like two other people I'm forgetting to name. Like, you hear Christopher Lee talking, and you fucking know it's Christopher Lee. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and the fact that he is in this game is still really, really weird to me. Like, of all the people they could have gotten to voice that character, they were like, what if we grabbed fucking Christopher Lee? What if we just did that? Sure, I, why not? Fuck it. <laughs> they get to the point pretty quick in this franchise where we've got money to throw around. Let's get this celebrity this time. And then for everybody, they lose that celebrity except for Haley Joel Osment and David Gallagher. And those are the two voices they don't lose. Oh, that's that are the- like even remotely knowable names. Even Hayden Panettiere is like gone by Kingdom Hearts, I think, Dream Drop. <laughs> I was going to say that Haley Joel Osment wasn't a celebrity at the time that they got him, but, like, I guess he was already in Sixth Sense, wasn't he? Yeah, he he was the Sixth Sense kid at that point, I think. I mean, granted, even nowadays, his sister's probably a bigger star than he is, even though I don't think she does a lot anymore, either. Who's who's his sister? Emily Osment. I don't know who that is. Uh, The best friend from Hannah Montana. I've never watched Hannah Montana. Uh, she, that's what she and she was at Spy Kids apparently too which I didn't know until like a week ago and I don't know why I learned that I don't remember anymore um, but yeah she was like one of the central characters in Hannah Montana so she was also very big at the time um, I, I've i seen Spy Kids I do recognize her character's name I don't think I've seen I, a single other thing she's been in probably not uh, but like that's it. Uh, they they do get some of the... Like, obviously, you can see where the limits of their money lie. Like, Robin Williams wasn't fucking voicing the genie. That was never gonna goddamn happen. Dan Castellaneta well, is yeah. all they can afford. And he's fine. Like, Dan Castellaneta... We've got, we've got the money for one celebrity. One. And we chose Christopher Lee. <laughs> Which I'm and fine you know with. what? You know what? They chose right. Because I I think Robert Williams would have been wasted on the game. Even though he probably would have found it fun. Robert Williams played a lot of video games. I wonder if he played Kingdom Hearts at any point. I doubt it. He didn't really have the, like, best relationship with Disney. But I I can imagine him, like... When was Aladdin 3? Because that's when Disney handed him a big bag of money and they played nice. Uh, let's find out. When was Aladdin 3? That would have been in 1996. So, okay, so lots earlier than I figured. (laughs) They had long since made up and played nice. They just didn't have a big enough bag of money. But I I do genuinely wonder if he if he played Kingdom Hearts at any point. The only game I know, the only games I know for sure that he played is I know he was a fan of Zelda. And I know that he, uh played like I think he played Sims stuff sometimes because he was like hired to do that thing for Spore when that was coming out Um, so I think he was a fan of at least Will Wright's games at the time but other than that I don't actually know I know he played video games but I don't actually know what video games he played Mm -hmm. but I could I could honestly imagine him maybe playing some of Kingdom Hearts. I don't know if I could imagine him getting super into it. Um, but, you know, 
But yeah, they could they could not afford Robin Williams. There was no way in hell. There was no no way in hell. But Dan Castellaneta. Yeah. He's he is perfectly fine as as the genie. I think he's he's a little You can hear Homer my, Simpson. You can but... hear Homer Simpson just a little too much, and that's my one problem with, with his performance as the genie, but he does a perfectly fine job. Yeah, it's well that people often say voice acting is a two word job. And the second word is the more important word. And mm-hmm. he, he he does that with the genie very well. He nails the genie's character in acting, even if he doesn't get the voice. And I mean, they still they still get like, obviously, Simba is not Matthew Broderick. It is instead Camp Clark. Yeah, that one <laughs> doesn't sound anything like him either. It's really funny. Uh because in case anybody forgot, Matthew Broderick is the original voice of Simba. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he played him in that movie. Uh, who who else would they have not gotten? I mean, they could get James Woods, but what the fuck else does he have they to should. do other than be terrible on, on Twitter? Yeah, uh, they should have gotten Jonathan Taylor Thomas for Simba. That would have been good. That would have been really funny. <laughs> uh, uh just have him voicing adult Simba. <laughs> <laughs> they should have done it. But, like, he's still using his kid voice somehow, <laughs> despite being a grown-ass adult by the time that game was made. Does <laughs> Jonathan Taylor Thomas still do anything? I have no idea. I genuinely don't. He's from, he was, he might got his start on Home Improvement, right? Oh, uh, his, his Wikipedia picture is from 1998, so I'm going to say no, he doesn't do okay. anything nowadays. <laughs> Probably not then. Uh, and like, you can even see that in the future of the franchise. Um, his where most credit was Last Man Standing. Fuck yeah, it was. <laughs> Fuck yeah, it was. Wait, that show is still going. How is this? <laughs> no, it's, it's not. I thought it was still going. Oh god, it is still. Fuck. Yeah, it is still going. I hate uh, to tell you this. <laughs> well, he most recently appeared in 2015. Jesus Christ. Um, you can sort of see that in the future of the franchise where it's the funniest being in Kingdom Hearts 3, uh, where you go to like Monsters Inc. and Toy Story and like John, like John Goodman's not in the fucking, it's not John Goodman and Billy well, Crystal. Okay, they weren't so, going to fucking get them. But then you go to, but no, then King, you go Kingdom to like Hearts Frozen. 3 is, Kingdom Hearts 3 is funny because it's where you start to realize that. <laughs> It's in your contract now yeah, that, that you're you, going you, to do Kingdom Hearts. Well, like, it, it is very obviously at that point, you can see the clear line to when Disney started probably putting in contracts like, no, if this character shows up in something, you are voicing them. Yeah. End of story. <laughs> like, Adina Menzel, you play Elsa until you die. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what it's in, and then you go to, like, fucking Toy Story, and obviously that's not Tom Hanks, it's his brother, which I think is really funny. Uh, and that's not Tim Allen, which, uh, we're fine with that. Uh, they even got the correct child to play young Elsa and Anna. Like, it is it is very clear that they started including it, and yet it's not Mandy Moore playing Rapunzel. Even though Mandy Moore was in Kingdom Hearts! <laughs> yeah, she voiced Aerith in Kingdom Hearts 1. And something must have happened there. <laughs> oh, for sure. Something had to have happened between, like, Tangled and Kingdom Hearts 3, or between Kingdom Hearts 1 and 3, where either Mandy Moore had a huge, like, caused a huge problem with Disney after Tangled somehow. Or, or maybe she just really fucking, fucking hated Square. being in Kingdom Hearts. Maybe, I don't know. She's not a very good Aerith voice, granted... Aerith didn't have a good voice until, like, two years ago in any medium she was in. Just gonna... Remakes the first time Aerith had a good voice ever. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's it. It's the first time Um, most of those characters had a good voice. Pretty much, yeah. Except for Tifa. All of Tifa's voices are great. That's a joke. Her... Advent Children is still pretty bad. Um, Advent Children Sephiroth's pretty good because it's George Newbern. And some- Kingdom Hearts 1 Sephiroth's pretty good because it's in sync. 
like the entire band. Okay. That's my new it's, canon. It's a good <laughs> joke. But have you ever actually like listened carefully to those voice lines? The, they're not very good. Well, yeah, when you get four people to do the voice at the same time, it's not going to turn out great. NSYNC was four people, right? How many people were in NSYNC? I don't actually know. <laughs> Five people in NSYNC. Fuck! Uh, one of them died before they could record for Sephiroth. <laughs> Uh, then he got better. It's fine. Uh, one of the members of NSYNC is named Joey Fatoni. That's a fucking <laughs> Sopranos name. Anyways. At some point, we were going to talk about the soundtrack. The music is pretty good, and I'm not going to get too super carried away, but I really, really, really like the music in this game. Um, and I, I think that Yoko Shimomura is, I think I've said this before, like one of the best in the business. I think she is my favorite composer. Uh, if I was given like a dream interview between like, if I was given the chance to give like a dream interview, it would either be her or Uematsu and I'd probably lean farther onto her. So um, I, because she's, I want to just great. I want to go first. Cause I actually have a song that I feel strongly about and I want to make sure you don't get to it first. Go for it. Uh, it is, uh, the Roxas battle theme, The Other Promise. This and song also is was not in the original incredible. game. I don't. I think it was in the original game. It just that it fight wasn't. wasn't because it doesn't. It also play at the end of the prologue. Uh, no, that's Roxas. That's just Roxas's theme. While the other promise is a battle version of Roxas. Oh right, right, right. So, yeah, they're the same light motif. Yeah, yeah, they're the same. They're essentially the same piece, just arranged differently. Yeah. Um. Uh. It's fucking incredible. Fucking incredible. Yeah, it's it's like it's got just the perfect kind of amount of emotion and uh, it still feels like a boss fight theme. It still feels like stakes are high and it also kind of plays in, I feel like, to the idea of, oh, you know who you're fighting. Sora doesn't have any fucking clue, but yeah. you know who you're fighting and you know what this fight means. It's It sells the emotion of the moment so well. Like, I... Like, listening to this song honestly kind of gets me choked up a bit. It is such a good fucking song. I, I I think it is my favorite song in the franchise right now. Uh, I think it's I, I think it's my favorite character-based song. Uh, it is definitely my favorite character-specific boss theme. Well, I think it's a tie between that and Vector to the Heavens. I think Vector to the Heavens is very good. That's Xion's uh, boss name from 358. I think uh, she I also has a really, really good I don't remember piece. that because 358 was not a time that I cared to pay attention oh, to music. Don't, don't worry. Just go listen to that piece and pretend it's the, it's on Spotify now. The The 1.5 version, which is honestly the part you should hear. And also there's a version in Kingdom Hearts 3 that is fucking incredible. But, um, yeah, like, I think the boss themes in this game in general are really good, but that is definitely one of one of the better ones. One of the boss themes that I like that it was also not in the original game because it's for the absentee silhouettes uh, is the 13th Reflection. I like all of the all of the Organization 13 boss fight songs, but uh, I think the 13th Reflection is my favorite with a very close second being the 13th Struggle. We're 
kind of far enough removed from when I played this game now to remember a lot of the music, but like I I, I cannot possibly say a single bad thing about it because Yokoshima Mora does not miss. This is an incredible soundtrack. And she, uh, you'll be able to tell when we get to games where like she was, she took more of a back facing role Mm. and other people handled more of the soundtrack, which is super weird because when other people do, I think dream drop is the first time that other people start working on the soundtrack alongside of her. And those other people are very talented and you can hear some of their stuff in three, but in dream drop, uh, Boy, howdy, you can tell she was not at the helm. (laughs) That'll be fun. Every time I Google a song from Kingdom Hearts 2, and I am reminded that the the version I'm familiar with is not the original. (laughs) Oh, yeah, no, you haven't heard, like, most of the MIDI versions, which will be really funny, because when we get to Melody of Memory, those are the only versions in the game. I, I, I for some reason I considered bringing up the Mickey Mouse March as a laugh, and <laughs> I found the original MIDI version. And fuck, this is bad. <laughs> oh yeah, PS2 MIDI's were fucking rough. Like you've <laughs> we've shown you the the original MIDI version of He's a Pirate. Yoko Shimomura <laughs> did her fucking best. Um, she did her best, but it was not enough. And I'm pretty sure in uh, in 2.5, they just copy pasted the uh, the MP3 from the movie. I think it's it certainly sounds like it. Um, but uh, I do like most of the reorchestrated stuff better, though. There is one notable exception, and I still could not in words explain why. But the battle music in Timeless River, uh, Old Friends, Old Rivals is actually better in the PS2 MIDI, I think. genuinely cannot word why I feel like this, but it is a feeling I have had since the first time I heard the, the like rearrangement of this song. Um, I think it's because they lay the, so there's that sound filter that they have over all the voice acting in timeless river to make it sound old timey. And mm-hmm. they lay it onto the soundtrack as well in 2.5. And they don't lay it on as thick in the original. And that's co- that's like the most immediate thing that I noticed there. And I I largely think the 2.5 version sounds better, but that filter sounds worse in 2.5. I could see that being the reason. Because I still like the regular field music of Timeless River better or the orchestrated version. I can still think that's better, but... I don't know. Something about the battle music is a lot busier. So the layered sounds with that filter on top of it, just it's kind of a mess. I think it's also just the percussion, I think, is a big part of that song, like the really heavy cartoony drums. And I think they're just more muted in the reorchestration. I don't think they're as prevalent. And that's a big part of the song for me, I think. I'm, I'm scared to listen to some of the PS2 versions of these songs. You'll have to eventually when we get to the rhythm game. That's all we're allowed to listen to. I still don't know why. Who knows? Because those are Uh, the original tracks. I don't know. Theatrhythm kind of has the same problem where it's like there are multiple versions of this song. Why can't we play like all of them? But no, you get the original which, I mean, it's not the worst, I guess, but yeah, it is definitely something that is that is missing. I could talk about the soundtrack of this game uh, until I die, um, 
one song that I really, 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 really love uh, talking about or just really love listening to in general is the third movement of Darkness of the Unknown, which is the final boss. I like the second movement too, um, which has more energy to it, but the third movement just has this feeling of like, it does this idea of finality. It's a very good atmosphere. Really well, uh, where you're, you're fighting in this fucking void um, and everything is sort of echoing around you. And it's, it's very clear, like, no, this is, this ends here. Like, this is where it is going to stop. Um, and it just, you can feel it through the music and how everything slows down and gets lower energy and just feels really cool. And I really, really love that piece. In like it nails the vibe. Every way. For sure. A hundred percent. And I, I'm going to stop myself before I talk about everything. <laughs> I think I think my favorite battle theme in the world, by the way, because I do want to bring up one more Disney World theme, is I really, really like... Uh, the uh, Land of Dragons battle theme. The orchestrated version specifically, I think, is fantastic because they bring in all of the, like, Chinese instruments. <laughs> That's one thing that Yoko Shimomura really, really nails in this series, I think, is like you cannot have Halloween Town sound the same as Beast's Castle or Mulan or Olympus Colosseum. Like those can't those cannot sound the same. And yet they also still have to feel like they fit in one coherent soundtrack and she somehow finds a way to do that. And then in the HD collections, she like really, really got to go a little bit wild in going and finding like instruments that would fit in a Chinese setting. And how do we make it sound even more Halloweeny in Halloween Town and all sorts of all sorts of shit. Yeah. Uh, Yoko Shimomura is one of the greatest video game composers ever. I. I I don't know what else I could say. She's fucking fantastic. And I can't to think we started this show without uh, you knowing who she was. I don't mostly. Think, I don't think I didn't know who she was. I just didn't know she worked on Street Fighter. Uh, yeah, there was that. Yeah. But yeah, it's a. Uh, it's a good game. It's a good soundtrack. It's a good. It's good stuff. I like I like Can Hearts 2 a lot. Truly incredible soundtrack. A game that haunts me. A game what? that I maybe someday I will I will be able to rest. No, I won't let you. <laughs> when Super Smash Brothers Ultimate 2 comes out and it's specifically the Kingdom Hearts 2 version of Riku and we have to play it again because this is our curse to bear for the rest of our lives. They threw beans on us. Uh, why? What? <laughs> why did that come to mind? <laughs> why did that meme come to mind? That has literally fuck it. Whatever. Who cares? It's a. It's a good game. I like it. What <laughs> the? That about sums up the vibe. Have a good day, everybody. See you for whatever game we're talking about next. Bye.